sea and covered the Red Sea. And in the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians, you will find this, that they were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized in the cloud and in the sea. And so therefore the cloud, you n note there, indicates the presence of God, which we will learn more about this in the very near future. But now to give you a quick correlation there, that cloud was a light by day and a pillar of fire by night. So then when it was in the uh, wilderness of Sinai, the children of Israel every night abode under the light of that cloud. That is to say, there was, they abode in the light 40 years while they were in the sanctuary. And to bring it over here and show the interior of the sanctuary, the high priest had to go in here every day and light that light so that there would never be no darkness in that sanctuary all uh, the time. It must be that way, that seven branch golden candlestick must burn through the night so that there would be no darkness. This is symbolical of the physical body of Christ. This tabernacle is symbolical of the physical body of Christ. So the cloud furnishing the light here in the greater and the more perfect tabernacle and the candlestick furnishing the light here in the sanctuary is what Christ is referring to himself is I am the light of the world. Through these seven branches that's on this candlestick, through the seven dispensations and the seven ages, he is the light of the world. Now then, to pass on into the next phase of it, the shoebread that was on the golden uh, table of shoebread, 12 loaves of bread was on uh, that table. With those 12 loaves represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And the high priest ate that bread on that table. And that indicated that the bread which was rained down in the wilderness of Sinai in the greater and more ta perfect tabernacle, it correlates it with this bread here uh, that the high priest ate when he went into the sanctuary. And that uh, was their daily bread. This was a daily function here, so that you can see it in the figure constructed by the man and the figure constructed by God. Now, at three o'clock in the afternoon, these lights, this light was lit. I'm giving it to you in our time. And then uh, the high priest performed these operations. Around this tabernacle, there was three tribes on each side. The picture does not show it as it really is. The three on each side made the 12 tribes. So with the three tribes on each side and the 12 tribes there, they were praying while the high priest went in to the sanctuary and burnt incense on the golden altar of incense. The incense represented the Holy Spirit, which the children of Israel did not have at that time. So when Christ come into the world, he said uh, that in his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed the Father for them, representing that sweet-smelling Savior or that Spirit that was in him, which was God incarnated in a physical body and it is illustrated here. And so the high priest had to pray there at all times, every day. And the incense took the place of the Holy Spirit until the dispensation wherein the Holy Spirit was to be given unto man. Then the dividing veil, see, synonymous to the dividing of the river Jordan, and an entry into the most holy place, where we have the wings of the cherubim overshadowing the mercy seat, which is symbolical to the throne of God. 
The Ten Commandments was laid in the Ark of the Covenant, representing the Word of God and God Himself being in unity, or the unity of the Godhead, and overshadowed with the wings of the cherubim. Now you find these overshadowings in many things, so when I refer in the future to overshadowing, or try to show you by my hand illustration uh, of the rainbow that overshadowed the Noah's Ark and so forth, and how that Gabriel went in unto Mary, and she was overshadowed with the Holy Ghost. Bear in mind, I am showing you how these things are coordinated, because we can't show all of these charts at, at the same time. Now I want you to pay strict attention to these quick uh, correlations. The Ark of the Covenant is a symbol of the throne of God. I mentioned to you before that the Ten Commandments that Moses received in the mouth was laid in the Ark of the Covenant. The Ten Commandment law being in the Ark of the Covenant symbolizes your heart with the law of the Spirit of Life incarnated in your heart. Hence, your heart is the throne of God. As you can see, all of this in this department refers to the heavenly or to the psychological and spiritual part that's not visible. It is correlated with the holy place, most holy place, I should say, here. And Christ is the high priest in your heart and in your mind. Or God is the high priest in your heart and in your mind. Let me drop down and show you the division. This line here, or the veil, represents the flesh. So then we have a physical body, but the spirit functions through our hearts why we live in this physical body. These symbols I refer to are the figures on the chart, and you are the reality of these symbols. So let me illustrate again. The blood, the water, and the holy anointing oil poured out on the head of the priest is symbolical of the Holy Spirit. The door is the entry into the tabernacle. Christ said, I am the door. I am the light. I am the bread. Christ is the intercessor. The veil is the flesh. And into this is into the heart and mind. So then you can see these pictures brought right over. The golden candlestick, the illumination of your understanding by the Holy Spirit represented by this dove. The bread illuminated uh, or, or in your heart represents the Word of God, not the book, but the real true Word of God as illustrated by the book. The golden altar of incense, Christ in your heart makes the intercession for you. For as the Apostle says, we know not how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit maketh intercessions for us with groanings that cannot be expressed or uttered. And then we pass on out of this, uh, out as this line shows here, into the Holy Spirit, which is all in representing the whole thing all the way through. The whole entire sanctuary, the whole entire tabernacle represents your physical body on earth. Passing through the veil, as indicated by the River Jordan, by the veil, and by the line here, and by passing through there, we enter into the heavenly phase of it. So entering into the heavenly phase, then this central part of it, of Canaan's land, is Jerusalem. 
the earthly Jerusalem is allegorical to the Jerusalem above in the spirit, which you see indicated all along this line. Now I want to pause here and show you uh, how that the sun, moon, and stars operates with our illustration. And when I say the sun, I have references to two suns. The first atom, which was the physical atom that was taken from the dust of the earth, and the sun in the sky. Watch closely. We're all familiar with the story in the Garden of Eden, how that Eve, being enticed by the serpent, the taken of the forbidden fruit, and gave to her husband, which was contrary to the commandment of God, that they should not partake of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And when Adam partaken of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, then his conscience became condemned because he had transgressed. And therefore his conscience was immediately darkened or condemned. That must reflect itself in the sun, in the sky, the planet. So then God waited until the cool of the day to drive Adam out of the Garden of Eden. Notice that the sun in the sky is going down so that darkness might be upon the face of the earth. And the Son of God is being driven out of the Garden of Eden. That is why he waited until the cool of the day. So the sun, uh, which is known to us as a planet, and the sun, which is known to us as the man, they must operate together. So therefore, his conscience darkened, and him being driven out of the garden in the cool of the day, it drives him out into outer darkness. You will see this reflected all along the lines at the bottom of the next chart that we are going to refer to. By him being driven out of the Garden of Eden, it shows that he was going down to degeneration. The first son in the flesh was being degenerated, degenerating the whole human race. Notice the quick correlation, the sun going down here in the sky and the sun, Adam, going out into outer darkness. Now then, Jesus Christ being the Son of God. Since this Adam is driven out into outer darkness, showing that he is dead, when Christ died on the cross, it had to turn dark over the face of the earth from the sixth to the ninth hour because he is the Son of God to redeem the first son. So it must turn dark over the face of the earth from the sixth to the ninth hour. In the evening it turned light and again it turned dark again to indicate that night. So then he rested in Joseph's new tomb over the Sabbath day, Saturday. And very early in the morning, if he is to be the regenerator, then the sun, which you see in the background, the planet sun, and the Son of God is raising from the dead, bringing him back into that state of, into which he was driven into that Edenic state or that heavenly state in which he was driven out of. One is the Redeemer and the other was the Degenerator. Now, notice vividly that they both are working together. The, the Son of God uh, in, the, in Christ and the Son in the sky. So as the Son rose, the book the Bible says, very early in the morning as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Christ rose from the dead. It is a split or a division between light and darkness as indicated by the elements in both cases. 
Now, I would like for you to retain that in mind so that you can see the, the correlation. Now, at this time, we want to move to the next chart so I can bring you up to date on how the entry of the vision was given to me. So follow me close. God made Abraham a promise that in his seed he would bless all of the families of the earth. His seed, truthfully, was Christ. But it must come down through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons, which the history is recorded in your Bible. And they went down into to Egypt, Joseph being the first. And there they, they multiplied in Egypt. And God, after pouring out the ten plagues and uh, instituting the Passover, brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt under a phenomenal cloud. And now you can see in this picture how that the blood of that Paschal lamb was put on each side of the lintel of the door, to the right, to the left, and over the head of the door, and the blood being taken uh, from the basin. And that Egypt, all over the land of Egypt, except Goshen, was in total Stygian darkness. You can see that this pastoral lamb pointed to Christ. So at his death, there must be darkness all over the land, except he is the light of the world that is on the cross. So now, that putting the blood on each side of the lintel of the door, you can see from one figure to the other why it was that uh, the darkness prevailed there. They went three days' journey out, you can see his death, burial, and resurrection had to be implicated three days. And three days out of Egypt, they passed through the Red Sea and was buried by baptism in the cloud, in the sea. And then they passed on out uh, uh, or through the Red Sea, the divided waters of the Red Sea, I should say, and into the wilderness. And now in the wilderness, they were given three days to clean up and to gather around Mount Sinai, which is indicated by this vast mountain. And that cloud that led them, they had to follow at all times because the direction of that cloud, in any way that it moved, the cloud had, they had to follow the cloud because it was being led by the cloud. So three days after God had given them time to clean up, those three days to clean up, they gathered around Mount Sinai, and God gave them the Ten Commandments. I want you to notice here that this is the actual history of the first church, or the first congregation, or the first assembly, that the world has ever known. The speaker, God Almighty, speaking from Mount Sinai, his introduction to the children of Israel. I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Neither shalt thou make unto you any graven images in the likeness of anything that is in the heavens above or in the earth beneath or in the waters beneath the earth. And so now you can see that this is the first church. And being the first church, not having the Holy Ghost within them as it was after the death of Christ. So now we have the root of the real first church. All of these were Jews. Please bear that in mind, that God is dealing with the Jewish race exclusively. 
And so now, the words that he spoke, uh, and this indicates him speaking or giving these commands. We have three uh, of these on one side and seven on the other. The three representing on this side the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. The seven on this side representing the seven ages that's engraved in tables of stone and laid in the Ark of the Covenant, which shows that he is the true God throughout the seven ages of time. And now, we would like for you to see, after that he spoke from Mount Sinai, the cloud covered the mountain. So all that you see in this picture, all of this that you see in this picture, consider it to be encouched in this cloud. It is impossible for the artist to draw all of it uh, so that it would indicate that, because it would be a conglomeration. But consider all that you see here in this cloud. And the cloud indicated uh, eternity, God in eternity, not in the realm of time. So then what I am going to speak of here, consider it to be intangible that you couldn't visualize with your physical eyes in the realm of eternity that must be understood through the vision that was given to Moses. And this is where God brought me in contact with himself and Moses to show me the creation by himself or by the tabernacle, which is the pattern. And so now you watch closely. And you will see the reason why I went through the one, two, three on the chart in order to show you the total of the Godhead in its operation in the creation of the universe. So now this indicates the vision. I will have Dr. Groh to read uh, where this vision comes in. But before he reads, I want you to see that the word exodus means departure. So the children of Israel had to depart out of Egypt through the Red Sea and in the wilderness of Sinai. And then God spoke the Ten Commandments and thereafter he called Moses, Aaron, who was to be the high priest, Nadab and Abihu, his son, and 70 of the elders and others not necessary to mention, up into Mount Sinai. And they visualized him as a great heavenly anthropomorphic being. So now we will stop here and put this vision in as it properly belongs, relative to the creation. And I will tell you about him being transformed into the tabernacle after Dr. Gross read. Read. I am reading in the 24th chapter of Exodus and the 16th verse. And the glory of the Lord arose upon Mount Sinai, and the clouds covered it six days. And the seventh day he called and Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now we have had him to read that particular passage in Exodus. If you notice, it said that the cloud abode upon Mount Sinai six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the cloud. It does not say where he read what took place in the cloud. So now I am going to put in parentheses in that book through trying to instill it in your mind what took place during those six solar days that Moses was in the mountain. And remember that we are in the realm of eternity and also showing you in the realm of time. So therefore, this is what took place. And this is what Moses saw in B.C. 1491 in the clouds, beginning uh, 
like this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. Many theologians think it is the beginning of creation. That is not the beginning of creation. It is the beginning of the vision. And so he said, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Spontaneous creation. And then uh, it was reeled off according to this pattern that we will show uh, in sequence each one of those six consecutive days uh, he saw in the vision. In the realm of eternity. Don't forget that. So now, uh, he's telling you here, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. So then the light was divided from the darkness. Notice that the divisions in the tabernacle I showed you shows you why it was that God being transformed into this tabernacle and the Father and the Word and the Holy Spirit being one as you see this tabernacle. Therefore, he had to divide the light from the darkness because of the vision in the tabernacle, as I have already showed you by the elementary chart. So then, that's, that constituted the evening and the morning constituted